Heavenly Father, we beseech thee. I kneel before you as a member of this age-old craft, praying to you for guidance as I am on a journey. A journey for more light, but more especially light that has been lost, forgotten, or hidden among the ages gone by. The light that connects us with our very meaning and informs us of our purpose. Light locked deep within our past, beyond lips that no longer speak, and paths forgotten, no longer traveled. Aid me in my pursuit, Lord, for historical light. Hey everybody, welcome back to Historical Light, an independent Masonic show focused on the historical events and aspects within Freemasonry. As always, I'm your host, Brother Alex Powers. I want to thank you for joining us again. Today is episode number 10, finally in the double digits. We're going to be talking today to Brother Brian Simmons about the history behind Ezekiel Bates Lodge up in Attleboro, Massachusetts. But before we get into that, I want to introduce our sponsor of the show. We are proudly sponsored by Masonic Revival. If you haven't heard of them before, make sure you check them out today. And even if you had heard of them, Make sure you check them out today. They're a great company, proudly sponsoring us, and they are offering some great quality, top quality materials in Masonic merchandise. You can find them at MasonicRevival.com. You'll find some great quality uh, lapel pins, bow ties, neckties, and so much more. So make sure you go there today and get some great Masonic fashion so you're looking good at your next meeting or event. And if you use our promo code, which is all caps, all one word, HLIGHT, you get free shipping on your entire order, so make sure you take advantage of that. We're also sponsored by viewers like you, so if you're a continued viewer of the show and you like what you see and want to help us continue and grow on our path and bring in everyone this historical light, you can do so on our website, historicallight.com, up in the support us section. Uh, you can give safely and secure, uh, securely to the show through PayPal, and we do sincerely appreciate everything that you're willing to offer to us there. Um, we will start off the show as we always do by checking in with our friends over at Masonic, or I'm sorry, at MasonryToday.com and see what happened in Masonic history today. Today in Masonic history, Brother Josiah Williams Begol passes away in 1896. And I do apologize if I'm mispronouncing his name. That's just what I do. I mispronounce things. Josiah Williams Begol was an American politician. He was born on January 20th, 1815 in Groveland, New York. Begol's maternal grandfather was an American Revolution veteran. Begol moved to Flint, Michigan, along with his siblings in 1836, there to become a school teacher. Later, he would begin um, getting involved into the town politics and would become the inspector of schools, justice of the peace and township treasurer. Begol was an abolitionist and became one of the early members of the Republican Party because of his stance on slavery. From 1856 to 1864, Begol was a county treasurer. He also started into the lumber business during his term as county treasurer. Tragically, also during his term, his eldest son was killed in action during the American Civil War. His son was killed outside of Atlanta, Georgia. It was the greatest sorrow of Begol's life. Begol was elected to the Michigan State Senate I'm sorry, to the Michigan Senate serving 1870 to 1871. He also spent three years on the Flint City Council. He was also a delegate to the Republican National Convention where the president, Ulysses S. Grant, was renominated for president. Then in 1872, Begol was elected to the United States House of Representatives. He served only one term in Congress. After returning home to resume his lumber business, he also got into the wagon building business as well as banking. In 1882, Begol had left the Republican Party and became the Greenback Party candidate, a party based in part on the currency reform and anti-monopolism, and the Democratic Party candidate for governor. He successfully defeated the Republican candidate, which as a former Republican created problems for him with the Republican-controlled legislature. As a result, the one of the few things he was able to accomplish during his term was the establishment as the, of the State Bureau Labor Statistics. 
Begol was also an early supporter of women's suffrage. In 1884, he became the first vice president for the first statewide suffrage organization, the Michigan Equal Suffrage Association. Begol passed away on June 5, 1896. He was a member of Flint Lodge No. 23 in Flint, Michigan. All right, well, thank you again to our friends over at masonrytoday.com for another great article. And please make sure you check them out at their website and on social media so you can keep up with them. They put out these great historical articles on a daily basis, which is a huge feat to keep up with. We really appreciate the work they're doing over there. Now, we'll go ahead and get into our interview for today. And like I said, we'll be chatting with Brother Brian Simmons of the Ezekiel Bates Lodge up in Attleboro, Massachusetts. I hope you enjoy today's interview. Hey everybody, welcome back to Historical Light. Very pleased to have on the show tonight Brother Brian Simmons from Ezekiel Bates Lodge up in Attleboro, Massachusetts. Brother, if you don't mind, I'll hand it back over to you if you can uh, further introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about your background. Thanks. I'm Brian Simmons. I'm the junior warden of Ezekiel Bates Lodge. I'm in all three bodies of the York Rite and um, past monarch of our grotto and the head of the Tall Cedars. Wonderful. So, brother, what was it that originally got you interested in Freemasonry in the first place? I would say the historical lure, if you will, really just kind of got my curiosity going. Great answer, especially for this show, right? <laughs> <laughs> so now, are you the uh, first Freemason you know of in your family, or do you have Masonic history, uh, either in uh, Blue Lodge or affiliate bodies as well? Well, it's kind of interesting. Um, I'm adopted, so I don't know, but I've always had a strange urge towards Freemasonry. Um, none of my adoptive family are members, or were members anyway, that I know of. Well, that's very cool. I'm very glad that you uh, you jumped in and made that leap into Freemasonry. It's obviously done a, a great deal for you, and you've given back to the craft in so many ways, and we'll touch on a lot of that here in a little bit. So if you don't mind, I'd like to kind of jump in. Uh, you are from Ezekiel Bates Lodge, and I had a chance to uh, come out and visit you guys just shortly ago. It's an amazing building, and you can just tell as soon as you step in there, there's so much history behind that place. Uh, if you wouldn't mind, would you mind to share some of that history with us? Sure. Um, Ezekiel Bates Lodge is an offshoot of Bristol Lodge, which is a Paul Revere chartered lodge from 1794, I believe. I might be wrong, but, um, so Freemasonry has been in Attleboro since then, and the towns as they grew, we had two centers at one point, and North Attleboro had the lodge, but many of the business owners were from East Attleboro. So a bunch of them got together and then they they uh, pulled the petition after the Civil War. Uh, most of them were Civil War veterans, which is fascinating to me. And then um, they formed a lodge, hopped around for almost 50 years before they started to hard work towards the building a building. Um, so our current building is a five-story. Um, not really sure how you how you would describe it. It's a very classical-looking Masonic lodge, columns out front, and um, they raised two hundred thousand dollars in 1928-1929, and ended up paying cash for it when the building was done. Wow, that's amazing. And it's a, it is a sight to see as well. I can, I can tell you, brothers, that if you have a chance to get out to that area and go visit it, I highly recommend you do so. It's an amazing building, and the outside is not the whole story. You get in, and it's just tons of stories. Like I said, you step in there, and you can feel the history behind it. Now, it looks like from being there, your, uh, your lodge is extremely active. Now, do you have affiliate bodies in there as well? Uh, we have an Order of Eastern Star body. We have... Well, we re-resurrected a grotto that went defunct in the 1990s, and we just recently moved a Tall Cedars back into Massachusetts. Um, and we obviously we have a community theater group in the basement. They're not really an affiliated body, but we definitely work off each other. Very cool. Now, when I was there, I was uh, 
lucky enough to see the side room you have as soon as you walk in and it has a lot of really cool objects. Um, would you mind to give us a little chat on what that is and what you got in there and where it all came from? About four years ago, I would say now, we uh, we decided to really start like cleaning up the building, so to speak, and trying to organize and really, you know, start refixing it up. It had been nearly dormant for about 30 years, you know, just barely staying alive. So we started compiling all these like crazy artifacts and things that you wouldn't expect to find in cabinets and drawers and closets. And at the time, the side room in the, in the foyer was the master's office, which equated to a junk room, essentially. Um, so we talked to the master at the time, and he was all for it. So we were able to clean it out, paint it up, you know, really make it look pretty decent again. And then slowly we started just displaying everything and rewired our old display case from the early to late 50s. Um, it all lights up and, you know, it's just unbelievable what was left. It's, you know, like a safe. Stuff goes in there, it never leaves. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I was uh, I was extremely grateful to be able to have the chance to go around there and just kind of look at everything. It's it's a great museum. I really wish our lodge had that kind of space available to do something like that. But the key point is, you guys had so much stuff ready to go in there. Now, where in the building were you able to find all this stuff? Literally everywhere you could imagine. <laughs> um, on the the east wall, we have a huge American flag with 42 stars. Um, I found this small room behind our elevator, and it just kind of kept going and around, and all this stuff's back there. We had the wind machine back there. We had the flag just folded upright, and, I mean, it must have been there for 40 or 50 years. So it's, you know, it's time to show it all off. That's always my uh, my favorite when you find those little back rooms that nobody's been in for however many years and you find those hidden treasures like that. That's, that's amazing. But the key point I want to touch on is the fact that you brought those out and brought them back to life to share with not only the brothers but the public. And to bring that history back to life and give it purpose again is really – I'm extremely grateful that you did that. And it's, it's huge work that we all need to do because – each lodge may not have as much stuff as you found and the top quality stuff that you found, but there is history there. Whether it's an old document or something laying on a shelf, it's amazing how much of the stuff that you walk by every single time you go to lodge and it's just sitting there collecting dust. Now, some of the things I saw, it looked like you guys had like two big bass drums sitting on the top there. Did you guys used to do uh, like community uh, parades and stuff with those? or? Oh, yeah. Um the grotto had its own band. Really? I should preface, back in our earlier times, um, 30s to about the mid-60s, we were up in the seven to 800 membership range. So filling you know, the ranks was pretty easy. So they had a full band. Um, they would do all the parades together. They'd do conventions and stuff like that. So we were able to restore one of the drums. We have another drum currently in restoration now with one of our members that's... Uh, you know, doing it right and taking the time because no rush, but right. And for the viewers to be able to get the full perspective, I, I will edit in pictures and stuff so they're able to see kind of the room in general. Um, but how many items did you say you had in there? I remember there was multiple cases and uh, mm -hmm. kind of stuff all over. How much would you say you've been able to collect to actually display in your museum room? Um, this this got to be close to about two to three thousand pieces because we That's actually. Amazing. Behind some of the display cases is storage where, you know, you can't put everything out. You know, right. we have whole bounds of um, Mark Mason marks from the 30s and 40s, and, you know, you can't throw them out. <laughs> oh, so, right. You know, we're just trying to preserve them at this point. That's amazing. Now, what would you say is your favorite piece or maybe the most unique piece that you found and been able to display in there? Um, well, a few... Probably five years ago now, um, the grand historian who you met, Walter Hunt, had yes. come down to the building and um, was part of the Lodger research team, and they did the installation for Ezekiel Bates Lodge. After the installation, he started uh, moseying around and poking in cabinets. This was before the museum, and he 
on the fourth floor, we have a whole hallway of commandry cabinets. And he happened to pop in one of them, and he pulled out a diploma. And it was actually from Ezekiel Bates. It was, uh, it's on silk. It's in disrepair. We have to get it restored, but it's 1820-something on a silk. And it's just, you know, it's it's a huge piece of our history. So that that's probably by far my favorite. That's incredible. And it yeah, it, it's crazy to think that that's just been sitting in a sitting in a cabinet for all these years, just unknown. Um, and you know, it, there's there's a lot of these stories like I've touched on with you know even my lodge that sometimes our past masters know, but they just don't share it with the brothers in general. And it's huge, you know. It's, there's there's going to be that group of brothers that's more inclined into the history, but that's a huge part of Masonic education. You need to let the rest of the guys know exactly what there is even if it's not physical items but even the stories behind the lodge because if we don't pass that information down it dies with us and that's that's a really sad thing to see so man that's that's awesome you guys were able to find that in there now touching on ezekiel bates for those not from the area may not be familiar who was he exactly ezekiel bates was a prominent mason coming out of the henry morgan affair a lot of the lodges had turned in their charter and bristol lodge was one of them um so Ezekiel Bates was instrumental in getting them their charter back and then helping the new members form Ezekiel Bates Lodge. Um, he had passed away right before they actually got chartered, but he knew it was happening. He knew it was named after him, so he was extremely grateful. But what we've been able to find out about him is he was a War of 1812 veteran. He was one of the engineers that first built the first train station or train depot, however you would call it, in uh, Worcester, Massachusetts. He was on the first shipload of ice to India, which I thought was kind of unique. <laughs> um, but, you know, it, it's hard to really get a lot of the good information because he wasn't a member of our lodge, so we don't have any of the records. But he was a member of St. Andrew's Lodge in Boston. Very so. cool. Now, one of the most unique items, at least for me, that really caught my eye when I was there um, you got these two machines kind of in the front lobby there, and I didn't know what the heck they were. Um, but the master of your lodge kind of explained that they were presses for dues cards. Is that true? Well, they were presses for everything. So when you have 800 members and you have to send out a notice every month, <laughs> you know, it's a little <laughs> rough on the secretary. So they're actually called the dressographs. One of the machines would make the metal plate that would be essentially like the stamp. And then it would go into a sheath, and then the sheath goes into a slide, kind of like a Dewey Decimal System when you pull out the drawer. And you put that drawer in, and it'll shoot through and just run all the envelopes through. And just one by one, it'll just stamp all the envelopes with the addresses. That's amazing. Now, where did you guys find those at? Was that just in a back room as well? Well, it wasn't a back room. And it wasn't until we found a member in Florida that had the blueprints and he mailed them up to us come to find out this little back room was actually labeled as a secretary's office <laughs> so oh, wow. it was in the right place but you know <laughs> that's hilarious so with that with that blueprint did you guys happen to find any maybe secret rooms or anything you didn't know about um no we've uh we've exhausted crawling through every nook and cranny and if we thought there was like a hidden wall we try to get behind it and uh, we found quite a few spots but right well that's always the interesting thing with old buildings that uh, you know I've mentioned before I used to do low voltage work with security cameras and everything and a lot of old buildings and you know through the years as they get modernized and stuff you get these little passageways that have been covered over or forgotten about and a lot of times that's where you find some really cool stuff you know history has just been patched over and forgotten about. Now, a, a huge thing you guys have been doing for the last two years now is this massive event called Masonicon. And I was lucky enough to come out and uh, be a part of that this year and extremely grateful to have that opportunity and definitely uh, looking forward to being there next year is a huge highlight of my Masonic uh, traveling this year. Could you tell us a little bit about why you guys decided to put together Masonicon and where do you see it going? Well, Massachusetts traditionally did two open houses where they would put money into advertising, which would benefit the entire state. Um, and then last year, they decided they were just going to do the fall open house. 
So we felt that we should still do something. Typically at our open houses, we'll do something community related where it's not really trying to get people to join the lodge as much as it is just trying to get your name out there and show them what you do. And, you know, if they're interested, they're interested, but that's not the purpose. Um, so we were trying to like rack our brains on what we could come up with. And one of our other members is a member of the shrine. We don't really have a shrine near, really near us. So he wanted to do a program during one of the lodge meetings where the shrine came down. And then I had another brother wanting to do a York Wright thing. And I said, well, what if we just, you know, set up like a convention and let's go that route. And then we had an entered apprentice at the time that was really big into education. And we said, okay, well, we have a big building, so we can do lectures at the same time. And it just kind of snowballed into this very large event that we didn't expect the first year. Yeah. <laughs> Well, you know, I, I didn't have the opportunity to go out there for your guys' first year, but this last year, just shortly ago when I was there, I was I was really kind of blown away to the extent of it. I mean, yes, it is a five-story building, and there was vendors on every single floor. Um, every room was basically filled. Uh, there was, you know, something for everybody and something always going on. There was no dead spots. Uh, you could go anywhere in that building and have something to do. And there's so many people. Uh, do you guys know how many people actually came through? Well, we had people coming in the back and we didn't get all the vendors to sign in. So <laughs> we all got together kind of and, and discussed it. And we're in between 400 and 425 is, is a pretty conservative total at this point. So yeah. I mean, it, it is a big number. It definitely was. There was uh, so many people there, and I thought it was awesome. Uh, it seems like a good amount of the fan base of Historical Light must be on the East Coast because I had guys grabbing me left and right, which was <laughs> still new to me, obviously. But it was awesome to be able to meet so many people out there and have those one-on-one -on -one conversations. So, man, if you guys have the opportunity, get out to Attleboro next year and hit up MasonicCon because it was just massive. So moving forward, do you guys have uh, anything already planned for next year? How's that looking? Well, we did our debriefing a couple weeks ago, and, you know, we, we kind of take it easy for a few weeks, and now we're starting to take all the surveys. We do a survey after it and put it in the, the event so people can go on there and give us their input. Um, so we're going to flip the rooms around. Instead of having vendors in the tower lodge, which is our top lodge floor, we're going to put the speakers up there because we're going to have we'll, we'll be able to AC the, that whole room. Oh, and cool. then the lodge room being bigger, we'll be able to put more vendors in there. So we're going to shuffle some things around and um you know, I'm 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 looking forward to it. A lot of people already reaching out with some lectures they want to give. So, including yourself. <laughs> yes, definitely. Definitely. But, yeah. Well, uh, I mean, you guys put on one heck of an event this year. I can uh, attest to that myself. So I'm highly confident you guys will pull off something even more incredible next year. Now, with this being such a huge event, how much work goes into it? I mean, obviously it, it's a ton, but how long does it really take you to, uh, to get it all put together to where you're able to implement it as you have? We do a, a, a timeline in advance where we'll start really – putting stuff on paper in probably July. Um, I'll have all the vendors booked by December and then we'll start advertising in February. Um, but you know, you know, it's, it's a big building, but you got to take care of it. So this is almost a way to force us to really, you know, improve things as we're going. And so it, it works out. I mean, it, it's, it's a ton of work. I mean, I'm not, you know, right. you can't really sugarcoat that, but you know, it's, it's a solid, it, it's a good endeavor for us as we're doing it because we're bonding, we're getting together. You know, we had 37 members there volunteering that day just to make sure everything was easy. So it, it's a it's a big undertaking, but I think it, it's well worth it. It definitely highlights the need for the newer Mason to have knowledge and education available to them. And the older Masons tend to flock towards some of the vendors more. And it, it just it seemed like it... it it worked out and everyone meshed together pretty well. Yeah. Yeah. 
Totally. I mean, everybody, there was something for everybody, regardless. So if you just wanted the fellowship, I mean, there were so many people there that, you know, kind of traveled in from all over, be able to do that. The vendors are there, the speakers are there, really something for everybody. So it's an amazing event. Um, I extremely enjoyed it and uh, I can't wait for next year. Um, before we wrap up tonight, though, you know, kind of going around the entire history of your lodge, is there any other uh, stories you'd like to share about Ezekiel Bates Lodge? You know, today we did a, a training with Grand Lodge, and I thought of you when, when I was being told the story, but um, a, district, a past district deputy officer in the Springfield Mass area came up to me, and we were talking about, you know, Masonicon and the history buildings, and, and it just kind of went off on a tangent. And they were cleaning their attic, and in Massachusetts there's a Joseph Warren Medal, which is essentially – a distinguished service medal slash lifetime achievement, you know, something along those lines. Right. And they're all numbered, and he came across number 172. And the gentleman on it, I can't think of his name off the top of my head, but come to find out, he was the founder of Indian Motorcycle. Really? Um, and it just sitting in their attic. <laughs> that just, is it's awesome. A, it's just amazing on what you can find. So now he has it out, and they're starting to dig more, and... So it's definitely, there's a trend going, because the newer, you know, I, when I say newer Masons, I'm, you know, it doesn't matter how old you are, it's just definitely, there's a new energy coming into the craft, and it's really starting to take a good shape, I think. I totally agree with that, and yeah, it, the amount of the history out there is just, it's insane. I mean, with, with anything inside Masonry, like I said, I always say it's an onion. I mean, you peel back a layer, and there's endless more layers to go through, it's there's always something there, and we need to bring that back to life. We need to kind of prolong that history and keep it alive. And that's that's why I was so happy to come in there and see that museum room that you guys have put together and been able to share that with the public because there's so many lodges, including my own, that there's still stuff sitting on the shelves uh, collecting dust. And, you know, we're, we're doing our best uh, to bring that back out to life. You know, that's... That's a huge movement of mine. Unfortunately, we don't have as much space as you guys have. You guys have a wonderful lodge with uh, tons of room to be able to, uh, you know, display that and put on your convention and everything, which is amazing. But extremely grateful you have taken the uh, the time and devotion to make that museum that you've done and really give give purpose back to the items that you have done. Um, now, is that open to the public or anything, or is that pretty much just for Masonic events that people get a chance to view that room? Um, anytime we open the building, so most of our meeting nights, if we have a program that's not tiled, then we have the wives there and everything, and we invite the public. So um, on a few occasions, they've come. We've had the Attleboro Historic Preservation Society come and do one of their talks on the history of masonry in Attleboro, which Walter Hunt put on for us. Um, so during all of those, we actually have them open to the public and people go through and they see names and stuff. I mean, if you look at the giant memorials in our foyer, every name on there is a street. So, right. You know, there's definitely, um, there's interest when people see it. They just don't know what they're seeing. Indeed. Well, I do uh, highly suggest anybody that has the opportunity whenever there's an open house or something to get in there and just see it for yourself. Um, you know, we can talk about it all night, but to actually get up on and in person see a lot of those items there and feel that history firsthand, uh, there's no way to actually describe that to you. So if you have the opportunity, get over to Ezekiel Bates Lodge, definitely check it out. And you know, MasonicCon next year would be a great point for that. So, you know, plan your trip now. I'll see you guys there. And, uh, I, well, I hope to at least, but it's going to be a great event. It'll be a great opportunity to be able to experience that history firsthand. But, Brother Simmons, I want to thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule to come on the show tonight and uh, give us this history that you have. So thank you very much. And would you like to give any final plugs or information about your lodge to everybody? Well, if you want to see, we have all of our history digitized for the most part. It's on um, eb1870.org. Um, we also have a Facebook page under the same title, or Ezekiel Bates Lodge. It's a little harder to spell that way, but, you know, um, look us up. We're always doing something. Well, that's awesome. Applause to you for digitizing your history. That's a huge push here. Hashtag digitize your history. <laughs> Do it. The physical copies are not going to last as much as you want them to. Digitize it. <laughs> I can't say it enough. 
Well, brother, yep. thank you again. We sincerely appreciate you taking the time and coming on the show tonight. It's been wonderful seeing you and talking to you again, and uh, we will catch up with you at the next MasonicCon. Well, I appreciate you having me. All right. Thanks so much, brother. You take care. All right. All right. Well, I hope you guys enjoyed today's episode as much as I did. I want to thank Brother Brian Simmons once more for taking time out of his schedule to come on the show and have that that chat with us. It was definitely an edifying experience. Um, as I got to meet him uh, in person up in Attleboro um, during my trip up there from Masonic Con, uh, it's easy to tell he's one of those guys that it's it's a joy to sit down with and have a chat. He's on fire for masonry and he's really dedicated to farthering his lodge um, in every way that he can. And his work shows. Um, if you guys have the chance to get up to that area, either from a Sonicon or just in general, definitely stop into the Ezekiel Bates Lodge. Uh, you won't you won't be disappointed. Uh, the museum room they have there, it just it, you know I know we talked about it on the show today, but it can't quite be described or shown in pictures to its full glory. It's really something you gotta be you know firsthand, face on face with some of those objects and experience that history firsthand. It's it's quite amazing. And, you know, they have the space to do it. Luckily, I wish we could have something like that at our lodge. Unfortunately, you know, we're limited on space and storage and all. But the way they've been able to uh, display those items is quite magical to just stand there and experience it one-on-one. -on -one. So great work, brothers. Um, definitely keep that up. And I hope all of you out there have the chance to visit the Ezekiel Bates Lodge and, you know, really witness that and experience it firsthand. So... Like I said, it was a definite enjoying uh, experience there. I hope you guys get to visit that as well. And I hope to see you all at Masonic Con next year. It's definitely in my plans as of now to be there. So I really hope we can make that happen again. It was a great experience. I know we talked about it on the last episode uh, quite a bit. But um, yeah, it's just it's not like many other Masonic uh, events that I've been to. Uh, it really kind of goes above and beyond. And I'm sure next year is going to be even better. So I hope you guys don't miss it. Now... I did talk before about Brother George Washington and this awesome little uh, figurine that I found at an estate sale. And I was quite pleased about it. And I mentioned on there, please let me know if you guys find the uh, the matching piece with uh, the Brother Benjamin Franklin that goes along with it. And my father-in-law, of course, shot me an email that he found one on eBay. I was stoked. Good price, too. So I hopped on there. I'm like, ah, that's it? And I ordered it. Well, it came. And I found out the hard way that there's not only one set, there's two sets. There is the figurines that are smaller, and there are the bookcase ends. And, you know, I went back and looked on the eBay listing later to find out, yeah, I just totally skipped over that in excitement and ordered it, which I'm thrilled about. I have two awesome pieces. But now instead of just looking for Benjamin Franklin to go along with this... Now I'm looking for George Washington to go along with this. So I've dug myself in a hole. <laughs> My wife's not too happy. But if you find either of these um, for a decent price, please let me know. I'm trying to farther my collection now that I have two different collections that I'm trying to uh, make a complete set for. But anyways, moving on. If you guys, uh, if you guys happen to see those, please let me know. And uh, hopefully I can... Uh, finish that collection without doing too much more damage to the pocketbook <laughs> but again i hope you guys enjoyed today's episode um, we will continue uh, the conversation as always over on our facebook group if you're not a member there please go join today that is the historical light masonic research group on facebook um, there's really edifying conversations going on there on a daily basis we try to keep it separate from a lot of the other Facebook groups out there where it's just you know filled with memes and ads and stuff for sale um, we only approve comments that are of historical Masonic nature um, so I apologize all you guys that try to you know send in the regalia ads and everything like that we just don't do that there um, there's a hundred other groups out there that those are flooded with and that's perfectly fine I'm just trying to keep historical lights group um, really dedicated to its purpose of purely bringing history so definitely go click join today we'll get you in there like I said great conversation on a daily basis um, we got a ton of members in there so far and it's growing rapidly so get in on it and uh, get in on the conversation um, also check us out at our website that's historicallight.com and if uh, you like what we do go ahead and order one of our products we have uh, we have lapel pins like 
the one you see me wearing today. It's really a great quality, actually produced by Masonic Revival, so you know it's great quality. Uh, we have those for sale in there. You can also get the official logo t-shirt for Historical Light uh, if you want to wear us around and kind of advertise us a little bit and show your, uh, your support of the show. That would be great too. Uh, so you can get either of those on there. And also, we have this continuing deal that we're putting on a little segment at the end of the show is why did you join Freemasonry? And like I've said many times before, that's opened up to affiliate bodies as well. So Eastern Star, uh, Job's, Rainbow Girls, Demole, we want to hear from all of you of why did you make the leap to join? And we're trying to keep that video series going, so let us know. Let us know why you joined, what made you make that leap into Freemasonry or the affiliate bodies, like I said. Uh, send in a short video clip and you might be featured at the end of one of our upcoming episodes. Today, we're extremely happy to have Brother Robert Johnson from the Whence Came You podcast, as well as being a host on a co-host on uh, the Masonic Roundtable, letting us know why he joined Freemasonry. So let's jump over and see what he has to say. Hey guys, Robert Johnson here from Waukegan Lodge number 78 in Waukegan, Illinois, under the Grand Lodge of the State of Illinois. And this is why I'm a Freemason. Because I love green beans. Because who doesn't love frozen pizza? Because who doesn't love pancakes? Because boiled hot dogs. I'm not really going to take a bite of a boiled hot dog, though. Because I love the minutes. Well, I don't love the minutes. And in fact, I didn't really join the fraternity for any of the things that I just said. But you probably already guessed that. I became a Mason eight years ago. Not a very long time ago, but it's been a while. And everything I've experienced in that eight years has been positive. I love this fraternity for everything that it is and everything that it really embodies. You see, I enjoy the fraternity, as in the fellowship and the brotherhood, of that shared initiatic experience that bonds us all together and makes us true brothers. I enjoy the esoteric and the philosophical truths that have been passed down since the beginning of history. And with that, it's enabled us to pull the thread and unravel a little bit of the mystery that is human existence, the psychology of man, the psychology of God, and all of these things that are under this great umbrella that we call existence. It all started about 10 years ago in Orange, California. I was at Orange Circle and there was a lodge building there and I really wanted to knock on the door but I just didn't do it because I was a little bit scared and I probably wasn't in the best place in my life to start a journey like that. But about nine years ago now, I guess, I had my first son and shortly after he was born I decided to join the fraternity and I actually received my first degree on his birthday. And with that the fraternity's gift to me and my family is the fact that now forevermore their father is a Freemason. I've got four children now and they will all tell you that I'm a better man today than I have been in the past. Every day is a little bit better and a little bit different. And I think most men will find that to be true because Freemasonry forces us to look inward and do the inner work to complete our spiritual and moral temples. I hope you found this video entertaining and just a little bit eye-opening as I gave you some personal details as many of the brothers from the great state of Illinois have done. I would encourage you all if you have further questions to send me an email or send the Grand Lodge of the state of Illinois an email or the Grand Lodge of the state of wherever you reside. Send them an email, get in touch with them, and make those first steps because contrary to what most people believe is we don't actually go out and ask you to join you have to make that first step we all did it too and that's how we know you're ready to go so again if you've got further questions uh, send me an email or check out 
www.ilmason.org and hopefully we can answer your questions and get you started on the greatest journey of your life. Alright, so thank you again to our friend uh, Brother Robert Johnson for sending that clip and allowing us to use it here on Historical Light, giving us a little farther insight of why you made the leap into Freemasonry. We're very glad you did so. Definitely check him out at his show, Whence Came You Podcast. You can also find him, like I said, on the Masonic Roundtable as well. They're both great shows, so make sure you check those out. And really consider sending in your clip of why you decided to join Freemasonry or the affiliate bodies. Your history is just as important to preserve as any of the others. And the reasons that you decided to join Freemasonry may just be good enough that it resonates with someone that's on the fence right now. And if they join, we can continue and preserve this great tradition called Freemasonry that we're all so proud of. So definitely keep that in mind, keep it in consideration, and uh, send in a video clip so we can share that with the world. So until next time, love to see you guys over at our Facebook group. Again, that's the Historical Light Masonic Research Group on Facebook. If you're not a member now, go click join and we'll get you in there so you can get involved in the conversations. And then until next time, we'll see you here on our next episode as we continue our quest for Historical Light. Take care.